PhD student at, at Dr. Vataki's uh, lab, and I'm studying time perception. And one, I'm one of the co-organizers of the Virtual Journal Clubs, along with Jonathan Cannon. Uh, we would like to officially uh, thank him for joining the team and John, welcome. Um, and I'm going to start with a few ground rules as we do with time. Uh, these talks are recorded and will be available soon on the YouTube channel, so you can rewatch them uh, shortly. Uh, I would like to request to mute your microphones while the speakers are giving their talks. And also after each talk, we will have a Q&A and you can place your questions at the chat or you can raise your Zoom hand and I can read it out loud for you. Um, we would like to thank Dr. Vatakis, Dr. Teki, Dr. Weiner and the ACR committee for putting these meetings in place. Um, and I'm suggesting we start with the introductions of the speakers now. So today we have Eddie Hendricks and Ishan Sikhan. Sorry if I'm pronouncing the names <laughs> in a wrong way. Uh, Eddie will go first. She's a second year PhD student at Utrecht University. She explores how event timing is represented across the human cortex using ultra high field functional magnetic resonance imaging and computational modeling. She has a bachelor's degree in psychobiology with a cum laude with honors and a master's in brain and cognitive sciences from the University of Amsterdam. Today, she's going to give her talk in hierarchical transformation of visual event timing representations in the human uh, brain. So uh, I will mute my microphone and every the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. So yeah, I'm going to talk about how timing is represented across the human brain. If you have any questions um, where something is unclear, do feel free to interrupt me so I can clear that up and you, everyone can follow along. Um, yes, yeah, so when I talk about timing in this talk, I'm going to talk about um, the duration and the frequency of visual subsecond events. So let's see, click, yeah. So um, we use timing every day in our lives, as you probably are all familiar. For example, for uh, the precise planning of speech and sports. But how is timing represented in the brain? Well, what we know so far is that um, if you see a visual event with a specific duration, if the duration is longer, your early visual areas will have a higher activation. And also, if this event occurs more often within a given time frame, there is also more activation within early visual areas. So um, these responses increase, but this increase is not necessarily linear, as you can see, for example, here. And I'll refer to these types of responses from now on as monotonic responses. And then there is a second type of response that was found in um, the supplementary motor area. And this response is not constantly increasing as for example, duration increases, but it has a very specific range that it responds to. So in this example, you could say that this neuronal population responds to a range from 100 milliseconds to 500 milliseconds. And there is a peak in this middle of the response. Now, different neuronal populations can have different looking uh, tuning functions. So this could be on another spot on the y-axis, or it could be more wide or more narrow, for example, or on the x-axis. <laughs> um, yes, so I will refer to these types of responses as tuned responses. So this is what we knew so far. And the re results that I'm going to talk about discuss what happens in between. How do timing representations transform as they move across the, the hierarchy of the brain? So where do both of these types of responses take place and what are the properties of the responses is more specifically what we're going to look at. And we looked at this using um, seven Tesla fMRI 
and we had eight participants. Um, and we used population receptive field modeling. And this was in order to find uh, visual field maps as regions of interest, and also in order to find responses to timing. So I will explain to you uh, the concept of visual field mapping. It may be familiar to some of you, but I think it sets uh, the stage very well also for what we're doing for timing. So this is what is happening with visual field mapping. Basically, there is a bar on the screen and it moves in horizontal and vertical directions. And then for each of the voxels we have in our fMRI data, we create a model. And this model has a receptive field for its neuronal population. Now this receptive field has a preferred position in the X dimension and a preferred position in the Y dimension. And it has um, a range around it that it also responds to. So it's basically a Gaussian function. Now we can conceptually place our bar on this model as well and see how this neuron, uh, neuronal population would respond. So here on this position, it wouldn't respond a lot. Then here it would have a high response. And then here again, it wouldn't have a high response anymore. So we can compare the actual data that we get from our fMRI scanner with the predictions that our model would, would make. And we see that initially this is probably not so good, but then we can update our model to find the ideal parameters in order to fit our actual fMRI data. So we can change the preferred positions and the spread around it. And then that should be a lot better. So let's see. Indeed, this is a lot better now. So we do this for each of the voxels in the brain. And the cool thing about this method is it gives us uh, a couple of results. And initially it gives us where our model can predict the data well. So what you're seeing here is basically uh, an inflated brain. So if you basically like blow up the brain uh, and on the darker areas, you see the sulci and the lighter areas are the gyri. gyri. Um, and the colored spots is where our model is performing well. But then it also gives us the parameters that it needs in order to fit well. Now this is cool um, because it allows us to um, find visual field maps, for example. And in this case, I'm plotting uh, eccentricity, which is how far from the center the receptive field of this each voxel is. Okay, so that's visual field mapping. So what about timing mapping? The timing mapping we're doing is conceptually very much the same, but we're not moving in horizontal and vertical space. Rather, we're moving in time, I guess. And so what you can change for time is how long a circle is on the screen, which is called the duration. And what we're changing is the onset of one circle until the onset of the next circle, which we'll call the period. Now participants need to do nothing except look at the fixation cross um, and all the circles are presented around it. And they need to press a button when this circle is white. And in this example, the duration is always constant, but the period is constantly increasing. So I hope that that's visible with all the internet connections. Um, and here we're doing a very similar thing. So we're making models that can predict our neuronal responses. Um, but now on the x-axis, we have the duration. And on the y-axis, we have period. And on top, you have what a monotonic model would look like. And on the bottom, you have what a tuned model would look like. Uh, I will go into the parameters a bit later. But the most important part is um, what conceptually is happening. So we step through the timing space. Yes. And this gives us uh, data that we can compare to the predictions that each of the models make. Now, in this case, our tuned model makes better predictions than our monotonic model. I'm using cross-validated variance explained or how well our model is doing. I would love to explain a bit more about this, 
uh, if anybody has any questions about it later on. Um, because due to time, I'm going to skip over that part. But all the results uh, I'm presenting you are cross-validated variance explained. Okay, so this is what our monotonic model looks like. It has an increase with frequency, but it's not necessarily linear. It has an increase with duration, but not necessarily linear. And then it has a ratio um, of how the duration and the frequency component are um, combined. So where is our monotonic model fitting well? On the y-axis, you see how well our model fits the fMRI data. And on the x-axis, you see visual field maps ordered from posterior to anterior. And we see that um, in the early visual areas, our monotonic model is fitting well and the fits increase towards TO, which is in line with what was previously found. And then we see a drop off in monotonic model fits. So then we know what happens between visual field maps, but we don't know yet what happens within visual field maps. Because these areas are retinotopically organized, we expect that um, the activation is highest near the retinotopic location of the stimulus. Now we're always presenting our stimulus near fixation. And so we wanted to see our monotonic model fits also highest near the retinotopic location of the stimulus. And we did this by splitting up our voxels into voxels with a preferred eccentricity range of uh, near fixation, where our stimulus was presented, and voxels with a preferred eccentricity range further away from fixation. And then we see that our monotonic model uh, fits best near the retinotopic location of the stimulus. So our monotonic model um, fits are very location dependent across the visual field maps. So then our second sub question was what are the properties of the models across the visual field hierarchy? And we see that um, Initially, the monotonic model um, mainly represents the duration component of uh, the response, and it increasingly starts to reflect the frequency component as well. We see that the compressive exponent on frequency or on duration um, stays very much similar across the brain's hierarchy. However, the compressive exponent on frequency is going down. So you could see that as in V1, there is a linear um, increase with responses. So every event, uh, the response increases. But in IPS0, um, this drops off. So a response to one event would be way more similar to the response of many events in this case. So conceptually, you could kind of see this as an abstraction away from repetition. A focus more on what the frequency of one event is. Moving on to our tuned model. Um, our tuned model has a preferred duration with the range around it, a preferred period with the range around it, and then an angulation of how um, this prefer preference blob is organized in time and space. It also is multiplied with the compressive exponent on frequency. So if we look at where our tuned model is fitting well, we see that tuned fits emerge around the TO area. And then we see that from IPS1 on, our tuned model is significantly outperforming our monotonic model. So this is a very gradual emergence um, of tuned responses and a gradual drop off of monotonic responses. And you can also see that when you look at the difference between uh, the tuned and monotonic responses. So this is tuned model fits in yellow minus monotonic model fits. So as soon as this difference is positive, the tuned model is outperforming the monotonic model. And you see that this goes very gradually. But why is this difference even interesting to look at? 
Well, it's interesting because um, our tuned model also has this compressive exponent on frequency. So there is a monotonic component within our tuned model. Now, if we subtract monotonic model fits from tuned model fits, what we're left with is a part of the response that can only be explained by having a peak, by having tuning. Um, so basically what we're left with is the additional variance explained um, that is caused by a tuned component. So we can also look for this difference, how that changes within visual field maps. And then what we see is that as soon as the tuned model outperforms the monotonic model, so as soon as the difference is positive, we see that the difference between eccentricity ranges disappears. So it seems that the additional value of having tuning or having a tuned component is the same across the visual field. Conceptually, you could thus kind of see this as uh, an abstraction away from the spatial location of the stimulus. So that's where our tuned model is fitting well. I'm also here showing you for one participant where our tuned model is fitting well. And in black here in the dotted lines, you see the visual field maps. Now I've done all the results for the visual field maps so far, but as you can see, they're not really nicely following the visual field maps. So let's get rid of them for a second. Um, what we're left with is these blobs of activation or of tune fits. And these blobs are in very consistent locations across participants. So for the next uh, pair of results, I'm going to talk about these blobs, which we labeled timing maps. Um, and I'm going to, again, talk about posterior to anterior, but now timing maps. So how do the parameters of the tuned model change across timing maps? Right here, you're seeing the preferred duration plotted on um, the brain surface of one of the participants. So if something is orange or ready, it um, prefers short durations. And for purplish, bluish, uh, it's a preference for longer durations. Now, the striking part is that these areas seem to be topographically organized. So as you can see here, um, this side is more orange, yellowish. And on this side, there is more blue. Similarly, if you look at TPCS map, here we have more red. And if we move through the map to the other side, there is more blue, purple. And indeed, if we statistically look at this, on the x-axis here, you have the distance traveled across a cortical map. And on the y-axis, you have the preferred duration or the preferred period, because the preferred period shows a similar pattern. And we see that if we cross the map, the preferred uh, duration or period increases. And between maps, we don't see a difference between um, mean represented preferred duration. So basically, this the center of this line is always around 0 0.5 in this case, which is the mean of the presented range. However, if we look across maps from posterior to anterior, we do see that there are less and less um, different timings represented within a map. So the intercortical range becomes uh, smaller. You could also see this as uh, this line becomes less and less deep as we move um, to the front of the brain. So the fits are progressively focused on the middle of the presented range. Then, lastly, um, the spread around the preferred duration becomes more and more narrow as we move from posterior to anterior. So this is basically what happens. Um, and conceptually, you could see this as a more and more precise representation of duration as we move for forward through the brain.
then the angulation away from the y-axis. So basically mm -mm, here, the position of the yellow blob in the model um, becomes more and more flat as we move uh, forward in the brain. Now note that if this model would only have a preferred period, there would be a yellow horizontal blob going on. So speculatively, you could see this as a progression towards more reflection of frequency. So in that sense, it's very similar to what we saw for the monotonic model, where the ratio also um, progressively reflected more frequency. We're kind of capturing that here in the angulation. And similar to uh, the monotonic model as well, we see that the compressive exponent on frequency becomes lower and lower as we move forward in the brain. So again, this conceptually could reflect an abstraction away from the fact that this event is repeated. So overall, we see that there is a hierarchical transformation of visual event timing uh, across the human brain. And we see that uh, initially we have monotonic responses and then this gradually um, transitions into tuned responses. And this transition takes place around the TO area. And we see that these initial monotonic responses are uh, dependent on the location of the stimulus, while the tuned component seems to be location independent, so abstracted away from spatial information of the stimulus. Then we see that uh, the responses of both models progressively reflect the frequency component, but also that this frequency is abstracted away from repetition. It more focuses on the frequency of, of one of the events. And then we see that the tuned um, responses that form are organized in topographic maps with increasingly specific representations. And these representations are increasingly focused on the middle of the range that we presented. And with that, I would like to thank all of the other authors and uh, all of the funding. And I'd take any questions. Thanks, Evie. That was a very interesting talk and really uh, nice work of yours. Um, I will go through the chat to see if there are any questions there and afterwards in, in the Zoom hands. I can't see any questions in the chat. Okay. Um, we have still time for some questions to Evie. I have a question myself. Uh, maybe it's a naive question because it's not um, my field, but uh, what are your um, plain interpretations on these results and potential um, implications maybe? Yeah, I think um, the initial reason we started out with this is because um, there is a general idea that we might need a specific neural clock, for example, um, in our brain in order to represent timing. And we wanted to see whether it's possible for timing representations to simply be deducted from what we're seeing. Um, but we're not conclusively showing that <laughs> because we're not showing how tuned representations are computed from monotonic representations. However, we are showing that um, there is such a smooth transition over the hierarchy um, that it might be likely 
And also in that sense, it kind of resembles, for example, how space is integrated over the visual hierarchy. Um, so I think the implication is that we think it's likely that uh, timing representations can simply be deducted from sensory information. Okay, cool. Thank you for your uh, reply. Uh, Dr. Martin uh, Weiner has a question for you. Hi, Evie, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thanks. Um, very cool talk. Just a, a quick question. Um, most of the views you show are lateral surfaces of the brain. Um, <laughs> do you have any backup figures showing medial surfaces? Because um, I think many people are probably interested to know if the SMA is among those regions. I suspect it's not, because at least it's I don't recall them from, from, <laughs> Harvard, yeah, from the previous papers. But something else we've wondered too is um, about the basal ganglia and cerebellum, which people wonder, and is that because they were not viewed? Like they're, they're, they just weren't, they're, you didn't get sufficient signal there or there was nothing yeah. there? No, we didn't get sufficient signal there. Um, we recently okay. checked it out because it is super interesting to check out the basal ganglia or the cerebellum, but we don't have, we have, we don't have a proper signal for our fMRI scans uh, there, so we couldn't check it out. Um, indeed, we don't have any results for the SMA where initially the first map that I talked about was actually found. Um, we think that it's very task dependent where exactly you will find um, the maps and we're not doing any comparison task here. We think that it may be, may be that. Cool, thank you. No problem. Okay, if we don't have more questions and for Evie, I suggest uh, we move to our second speaker. Of course, if somebody comes up with a question, please uh, type it in the chat button and then we can ask um, Evie at the end. Okay. So uh, our second uh, speaker, as I said in the beginning, uh, is Ishan uh, Sinhan. He's a fourth a year PhD student at the Indian Institute of Technology. He is working in the Department of Cognitive Science on a thesis aiming to unify temporal phenomenology, time perception, and time timing of cognition. Uh, he was recently awarded, actually, with a, an ASSC William James Prize for a theoretical contribution made towards this goal. And today he's going to discuss the link between timing of cognition and time perception, some empirical um, evidence. The same goes for his hand. He can uh, have a 10 minutes uh, Q&A at the end. So his hand, um, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ishii, for the introduction and um, inviting me for this talk. I hope everyone can hear me when I just get started. Um, may can people hear me? Should I go on? Yes, of course. We okay. can see your screen and whenever you're ready. Thank you. So, uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking about uh, whether um, visual representations have temporal properties and how we can test that. So what I'm basically going to do in this talk is um, try and motivate why I'm trying to study temporal properties of visual representations. Then I'm going to briefly talk about um, some philosophical grounding for it. Um, uh, talking about um, <clears throat> time as its own representation. And then I will go over to behavioral studies that where we try to explore this link. But, so to start off, why do I think um, studying time is crucial uh, as a property of uh, mental representations? One, <clears throat> the first point is that uh, I think it's the only property which is present in both uh, representations and what we experience. To give you, to give you an example, 
um, not only do we experience time itself, but our representations of content also change in time. Like this is not, I mean, this does not seem to be true for any other prop, I mean, any other psychological property. I mean, think about being hungry or being emotional. While you can experience these things, nothing in your brain itself has to be hungry or emotional for you to do, uh, experience that. But I mean, one idea is that time could be a shared property between the representations and the content of those representations. The second point is that uh, time seems to be an inescapable property of experience. So no matter what experience we have, whether it's I mean, irrespective of modality or state of experience, we seem to, I mean, represent them with some temporal properties. And by temporal properties, I mean something like order, change, duration, extent, persistence, and so on. So, I mean, if you buy into these two grounding pillars, what you are left with is this question that you can ask where can time be its own representation? And what I mean by this is, uh, you can have mental representations in, uh, let's say, two ways for now. You can have atemporal representations, then you can have temporal representations. So what this means is if you look at the left panel, what I'm calling temporal tagging, you can represent time in a in atemporal way, similar to how we represent time, say, on a letter on a, or on an official document where we stamp the date on it. Or when we take a picture, we have a timestamp it says when this picture was clicked. Right? So you can have mental representations of time that tag uh, perceptual events, and that's how they estimate duration. Another atemporal way in which you can uh, get a sense of time is how your car does it with the speedometer. Right? So here, this needle just points to a speed, and uh, what you essentially have is the uh, speed at which the needle is pointing to is the speed at which your car is going. Right. But you can also have temporal representations of speed, which you can see in the second B column that I have put up there. So what I have here is what is called an anemometer on, on the right bottom. So what this thing does is it, it measures wind speed by rotating it, itself at the, speed, at the speed at which the wind is blowing. And then you can have representations of the durations by things like pendulums, which swing at the duration at which they're representing. So uh, the question that I was trying to investigate was whether our mental representations more like temporal tagging or whether they're more uh, like temporal mirroring. And this uh, sort of question has been asked in many different ways across uh, cognitive science actually. So you have people conceptualizing it as brain time versus event time. Uh, this is sort of the terminology used in neuroscience. Then you have uh, temporal tagging or temporal mirroring hypothesis, which is sort of used both in psychology and philosophy. And then you also have modal and immodal representations of time where you can extract in time as compressed memory, or you can represent events in time itself as extended. Right. So to, I mean, to address exactly this question, I will be presenting two studies to you. And the, the first one actually considers um, perceptually evolving content and perceived time. So this is what you're going to look at. And I mean, this um, study actually recently came out. So if went over it too quickly. Uh, if there's some additional things you want to follow it up on, you can always look it up. So what did we do here is we tried to ask uh, whether uh, mental representations are uh, temporarily tagging events or whether they're temporarily mirroring events. So to ask that question, what we needed to show was, one, we needed to show whether perceived time changes as a function of a change only in experience. And concurrently, we needed to show that there is itself a, a change in perceived content. And right now, this might seem like uh, a little weight, but hopefully, as I move across the presentation, things might become clearer. So, to address the first problem, that is uh, to use something that uh, we could use to ch uh, change something only about a perceptual experience. 
we thought we'd use the Necker cube. So what happens here is, uh, this is a typical bistable figure. So nothing about the stimulus changes, but you can see this cube oriented in two ways. You can either see it pointing downwards or you can see it pointing upwards, right? And what happens is as you view this figure, this, your perception of it keeps switching. And it seems like this perception switches instantaneously, right? This perception seems to switch like a step function. But uh, for this perceptual switch to occur, if, I mean, if you're following up uh, on these perceptual switches based on some, let's say, neural signatures, what you see is that uh, it takes some duration for this perceptual process of switching to occur. But to, in our experience, it seems that uh, this switch is instantaneous. It, so what I'm trying to say is, uh, Uh, it seems as though there is some duration left out of our experience, like because given it takes some time for a perceptual switch to occur uh, when we speak in terms of neural signatures, but it seems instantaneous in our perception. So what we wanted to do with this Necker cube is to show it to people on uh, the screen and force a perceptual switch in it and to see whether uh, for durations, oh, sorry, for intervals in which a perceptual switch occurs versus for intervals in which a perceptual switch doesn't occur, whether different models of time perception would propose different predictions for what happens to perceive time. So what we did is we kind of broke down uh, time perception models into whether they seem to have a temporal tagging or a temporal mirroring uh, Sort of representation built into them. And what happens is if you have a uh, temporal tagging sort of, uh, um, okay, <laughs> so I'll go through it a little more slowly. So if you take something like a clock model, which is in some sense classically isolated from conscious perceptual experience, you wouldn't actually predict any change in felt time irrespective of or whether an echo keep switches or not. If you look at uh, time perception models that uh, link perceived time to a function of arousal, attention, or perceptual classification, you would predict that given um, perceptual switches attract attention or increase perceptual arousal or involve a perceptual classification, that these models would predict that perceived time would actually dilate in intervals in which a perceptual switch occurs. And finally, you have uh, models of time perception that take into account boundaries of perceptual content, either through memory or perception, which would actually both predict that uh, intervals in which a perceptual switch occurs would be estimated as lasting for shorter duration, either because the memory of it was compressed or because uh, people fail to see the uh, perceptual process involved in perceptual switching. So uh, with this in place, we set out to do three experiments. And the first two are what I'm showing you right now. So what we did was we presented an echo cube on the screen and we instructed the participants to see the cube in a uh, particular orientation. And when they were uh, readily seeing uh, this orientation, they had to press a key. And as soon as they pressed a key, uh, a rod-like object moved across the uh, necker cube. Now this object either maintained the geometry of the percept that they were initially instructed to see, or it violated the geometry of their percept. And uh, this rod took like four different durations to go across the screen. At the end of each trial, what we asked people was to estimate the time taken for this uh, rod to go across the screen and to tell us whether a perceptual switch occurred or not. This is in uh, experiment 1A. In experiment 1B, we ran the exact same design, but we asked only for uh, duration estimates. We didn't ask for uh, uh, reports of whether a perceptual switch occurred or not. So uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is just like a GIF playing over and over again to give you a hint of what uh, our stimulus looked like. 
And what we did was on the left, I'm presenting results from experiment 1A, where we got reports for both perceptual switches and durations. And when you sort these trials based on trials in which a switch occurred and a trial in which a switch didn't occur, what you get is uh, this sort of underestimation of duration for trials in which a perceptual switch occurs. And um, on the right, I have results from experiment 1B, where we only ask people to report durations. So the reason we did this was we didn't want to, um, I mean, one fear that we had was we didn't want to overload the participants by having to look out for a perceptual switch and having to report duration. So all we asked them to do is uh, report the duration of the rod. And then we sorted the trials based on whether uh, the rod violated the geometry or maintained the geometry of the cube. And here also we sort of get that effect where um, trials in which a geometric violation occurs is, are reported as uh, occurring for shorter durations and trials in which it doesn't happen. Right. So uh, after all this, another confound that we wanted to take care of was uh, the moving object itself. So in the third experiment, what we did is we just presented the cube on the screen. And after some variable duration, this cube would change its color to red. And it, and it would stay red for either of these four durations. And then it would go back to being in an original color and then disappear. And again, here for each trial, what people were asked to do was estimate how long this cube stayed red and whether a switch occurred while it was red. Right, so uh, here we try to remove sort of that moving object confirmed or the speed of the moving object confirmed from our design. And what we find here is again, uh, similar results where uh, uh, durations for which um, a perceptual switch occurred were estimated as lasting for shorter time. And this experiment sort of showed slightly stronger results than the first experiment. Now, now uh, what we've done is we have shown that, um, well, intervals in which a perceptual switch occurs are being perceived as shorter. But what we don't know is whether this is happening because people are um, segmenting a trial based on whether a switch occurs or not in their memory, or whether they're actually perceiving the interval as lasting for shorter duration. Right? So uh, the problem is, the event segmentation is a temporary tagging sort of representation uh, uh, mechanism, whereas the uh, live perceptual trace sort of representation is the temporal mirroring account. The problem is both of them predict the same thing. So how do we differentiate between them? So what we did for this is we created a phenomenological demo. So what we did was we took the echo cube and we pra placed a repeated number, uh, a repeating series of numbers inside the network cube. And I'll just show it to you in a moment. Now, what we wanted to see was, um, given this entirely predictable number stream, which is just going one, two, three, four inside the network cube, when people are looking at the cube and the network cube switches, do people miss uh, seeing a number inside the cube? So if people are looking at this cube and it goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then a switch occurs, do they see it as one, two, four? Right? Do they miss out on seeing three if the perceptual switch occurs at the time of three? Now, uh, we don't have very uh, controlled or very uh, nicely, uh, uh, what do you say, investigated empirical data for this. All, all what we did was we showed participants this GIF uh, to those who completed our third experiment, and we asked them to report whether uh, they miss they miss seeing a number when this uh, perceptual switch occurred, and about uh, three quarters of them uh, report that that does happen. So we sort of use this as validation of um, the temporal mirroring account where something actually goes missing at in your perception at the time of a perceptual switch. And that is why you sort of um, report this duration as lasting for a shorter time. Right. So <clears throat> what we uh, 
what we wanted to do with this study was sort of uh, put out there some empirical evidence with uh, uh, duration estimation that shows that duration estimation can be a function of how perceptual representations themselves evolve in time. And uh, as Evie was uh, also talking about, what we're also interested in, in showing is that um, how you estimate time is based on what you see, not based on uh, some you know, hidden clock ticking away uh, at its own frequency. And another thing that we wanted to do was uh, like many people investigate time in different ways, like in neuroscience, philosophy, and psychology. One of the uh, cool things that we wanted to do with this uh, study and what I'm trying to do otherwise with my work also is to bring these uh, sort of investigations together. And uh, there's a, I mean, the demo that we used was also um, a way to show that um, can we come up with different sort of perceptual illusions or, or different sort of designs where we can investigate whether uh, uh, alterations in perceived time are based on memory or perception. Right, so I will very quickly go over the second study also. Now, this one is currently still being done. So I'm, pre I'm presenting some preliminary data to you. So what we, uh, in this study, what we asked was what else can we do with this uh, temporal mirroring account? So what we wanted to do here was we wanted to show that some temporal uh, independent variable, if it can lead to some perceptual effect, and then you take the same perceptual effect, and then you show that now it affects time as a dependent variable. So what we wanted to do here was uh, use an independent variable of time as flicker, and show that flicker changes something about perception. And when the same thing is, uh, when the same perceptual phenomena happens itself, it changes, let's say, temporal sensitivity. So what we did for that is uh, we took uh, figure ground segregation. And I'm hoping that this sort of thing is familiar to everyone, which, uh, I mean, the basic idea is how do we segregate regions as figure and ground? And this comes from the classical gestalt clause where you can do it based on closure, proximity, good continuation, similarity, and so on. But you can also do figure ground segregation based on uh, temporal sensitivity. So you can take um, arbitrary regions and flicker dots in those regions at different frequencies, and you can uh, induce figure ground segregation. And there is a actually a long literature on this uh, based on, I mean, uh, linked to the magnocellular and parvocellular pathways in the brain. And I will show you how exactly this works. So what you wanted to do with this is you wanted to use it as a test of temporal correspondence. That means if we can induce figure ground segregation based on uh, some flicker, uh, so like flickering some stimuli, can we also show that when people view a region as a figure or a ground, their temporal sensitivity for that region is different? And uh, this is exactly what we uh, investigated. So the first experiment, uh, what you've done is you've taken a, a wide square region, as you can see on the left here, and you've divided this region by an arbitrary contour. And what you do is we flicker dots on either side of this contour at different flicker frequencies. And uh, I'm hoping if uh, my internet is working on yours also, you can see it uh, flickering properly. So the right region is flickering slightly slower than the left region. And uh, what we wanted to see was whether uh, regions which flicker at a slower rate are seen as a figure compared to regions that flicker at a faster rate. Right. And for this, we used uh, four different frequencies and six different pairs in which we flickered them. So we could have one region flickering at two hertz while another flickering at 16 hertz and so on. And we counterbalanced which side flickers at what rate. And what we did was we asked, I mean, we, um, this display was shown for like uh, one and a half second. And then what he asked was we asked people to guess uh, uh, to tell us which side of this contour looked like it was in front of the other side, or which side looked as the figure. 
and we ask them to rate their responses on a scale of zero to three, with zero being uh, guessing and three being extremely clear progressively. And uh, very quickly, what we found was that their clarity rating for seeing a region as figure increases as the clicker frequency differences between these two regions increase. Now, what we did was we uh, wanted to complement this result with uh, temporal sensitivity. So for this, what we did was we took the Rubin's taste bars illusion and we uh, made participants do a temporal order judgment while they viewed this uh, figure. So uh, we made them do it while they saw this white region as a vase, that is when they, when the dots appeared, when they were seeing this region as a figure versus when they were seeing this region as a background. So the same participant did the TOJ task twice, once when they were seeing a region as figure and once when they were seeing it as the background. And if there is a temporal correspondence between flicker and uh, perceptual sensitivities for figure ground, we predicted that uh, regions in which, uh, sorry, participants would have a higher uh, temporal resolution for when regions are viewed as background compared to flicker two figures. And uh, this is what we found, that for, for the same region when it was viewed as a uh, background, participants' temporal sensitivity as plotted by the slope of their psychometric function was higher compared to when the same region was viewed as a figure. So um, quickly coming to the end of it, what, uh, what we're trying to show is that uh, not only can we show a mapping between uh, how our perception evolves over time with how we judge durations, but we can also draw a correspondence between flicker sensitivity for figure ground segregation, segregation and uh, uh, temporal resolution for uh, the same region. So the idea is that you can start linking different temporal properties like duration estimation or temporal resolution with temporal properties of mental representation. And uh, what this also sort of allows for is coming up with a easier or a simpler explanation for different temporal properties that uh, we study, like, you know, we study order judgments or synchrony or duration estimation and so on. So if we start assuming that uh, mental representations also have these uh, properties in common, we can um, start studying these properties together. Like you can have models that uh, that commonly predict duration estimation, also predicting temporal resolution and so on. And uh, I mean, the core idea of this is uh, to demonstrate, uh, I mean, to actually empirically follow up on a demonstration that we did last year where we argued that different investigations of time in neuroscience, philosophy, phenomenology, psychology can actually come together if we buy into this idea that uh, uh, we, I mean, our uh, experiences sort of follow this uh, temporal mirroring system of uh, representation. So um, that's all from me. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sam. That was a very insightful talk, actually. I have some questions myself, but uh, let's first go through the chat, uh, because I saw a question coming up in the very beginning of your talk. Um, <clears throat> bear with me a minute. Oh, yes, there is a question. Uh, how did you, um, how did the participants report the duration? I think uh, this is referring to <clears throat> the experiment you did in the beginning with the cube, uh, that they had to, to report uh, the duration. Okay. So uh, for the duration estimation, we asked participants to do uh, what is commonly called the verbal report method, where participants are asked to type in uh, their duration estimates on the order of uh, milliseconds. Yeah, so that's the method that we use for duration estimates. Okay, um, so 
Could you provide some training, for example, in the beginning, so they could yeah, somehow yeah. estimate, okay, the yeah, time. Yeah. So, we, so we train them on the same durations that we're going to be using in the study. Okay, so they had feedback, so they had somehow uh, previous knowledge on how to calculate each day, the time, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, I'm, I'm going back to the chat because I, I saw uh, another quick question. So uh, one of our participants is writing in inspiring talk. It's Han, nice to see experiments rooted in theoretical framework. Quick question, was blinking similar in two conditions? Would blinking refresh perception which would confound the results? Okay, so I think by blinking, you mean eye blinks. Uh, so yeah, we didn't uh, use an eye tracker when we were doing the study. So yeah, I have no way of answering the question, but um, I mean, uh, um, your question is uh, <clears throat> also, I mean, it's <clears throat> something that has been getting a lot of over the past few uh, months where a lot of people have asked me to redo the experiment with eye trackers to see where people were looking at the time of the perceptual switch or whether they were blinking the eye. So I think uh, you're on the right track with that question. Hopefully I can answer that question in the future with the eye tracker. Okay. Um... If we don't have more questions, because I see that uh, um, we are exactly on time. I had a question for the last experiment with the vase, but I would probably just drop you an email to, to ask my question. Uh, if any of the attendees have uh, final questions, we can go quickly through them. Um, Otherwise, uh, we will renew our appointment for uh, the next month on 26th. We, we will have two talented uh, early researchers as well. And we will share more details on the talks uh, shortly by email. Uh, so thank you for joining today. And thank you, Evie and Ishan, for giving these insightful uh, talks. Uh, we will be in touch for more questions. Yeah, thank you. Okay, see you soon.